I think when I first met Doug must be lost in prehistory. Burton Blatt had asked for me to come to his office for a meeting. And as I remember, Doug was there. Well, yeah, I think it was 1972. After we had met with him, uh, I walked out in the hall with Doug, and I said, is this guy for real? And Doug said, he's real. I have been a colleague and friend of uh, both Doug and Sari's for, I gotta go by the ages of my kids, 40 years. Doug's work on behalf of people who are non-speaking and who are autistic had long captured my uh, imagination. So when I finally met him, I felt like I was meeting one of the Beatles. <laughs> I met Doug um, in 1989. It was my second year of teaching. Um, I was teaching his daughter, Molly, over at Le Levy Middle School when she was an uh, eighth grader. I remember the first time I met with him, actually, when I was thinking about coming and going into his office and being incredibly overwhelmed. It was kind of a disaster in there. I had to sit very precariously on his broken chair. And we got to talking, and I said, you know, I, I understand that you've uh, done this work in autism research, and I just saw this CNN documentary, and you've got to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I was excited, not just because he was a Bowdoin alum, but because even though we were not there at the same time, in fact, I think Doug graduated the year that I was born. I'm like, who is this Doug? Let me go look him up. What I was most struck by is how excited he was to have a deaf woman a deaf lesbian at that, with glasses, applying for a job in the School of Education. He had a flight to catch, because I think he was going somewhere. So he just seemed kind of preoccupied. So I left um, Syracuse feeling like, wow, you know, it was really good, but that dean just hates me. And I remember looking up and thinking, wow, he's really tall. My first meeting with him was his office, and the artwork that I saw there, I remember getting into a car because he was taking us to dinner and he just took off his tie and was so casual and I just felt really awkward because I was there for an interview and I was formal and he just took off his tie. So the first thing I did was, when no one was looking, I took off my tie and just unbuttoned <laughs> the top of my shirt. He welcomed me with open arms and um, we got to know each other, we got to know each other's passions and um, I always was very grateful that he never thought less of me because I wasn't an educator. Ooh. Well, that would have been in the 70s. Really? Yeah. I didn't know you really known each other. Oh, we go back. We go back uh, quite a few years. We uh, shared, I think, both this interest in creativity, and I also um, uh, ascribed some of Doug's interest in architecture to his son, Noah, because I thought, well, you know, it was through Noah that he knew that architecture mattered. I met him first. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> You have to keep in mind the era. This was, this was the early 70s. Bob, Doug, and I were all committed uh, to uh, ending social injustice, anti-war, you know, the middle of the Vietnam War. Uh, we had come out of protest movements. And what, what Bert taught us was this is another civil rights social justice program. Bert was just so welcoming and friendly with all of these people. And uh, I think he taught us a very important lesson. And I think Doug personifies uh, the outcome of that lesson is, uh, you know, don't hate your enemy, just hate what the person may be supporting and doing. It, it, it was an opportunity too. To, to combine our scholarship with, uh, yeah, with, with values we were committed to anyway, social justice values. There was a sense of this uh, being a national movement. It was really something. We felt our, our generation was going to solve the problem. You know, Bert was really, Bert Blatt kind of rode shotgun. Yeah, we were developing consciousness raising groups and was that 1970, 71, 72, geez Louise. We worked directly with disability and family groups and we organized groups. And, and that was really Doug's forte, was community organizing. Doug had the ability to get very connected to the parents and was there from the ground, you know, and he really 
brought the parents along. So these are people that had kids with needs and no one to talk to. So he, he was a genius in that regard. And Doug, you know, really shaped what the center was uh, to become. And I think uh, the self-advocacy, the parents. What Obama talks about is community organizing. It does exist. There's a skill set for it. And we did it here. My initial office was shared with Doug. It was kind of the living room of the house on uh, Ostrom Avenue. So Doug had done some work in China, research over there, I don't know. And he became the mad seamstress. You didn't know this about Doug. He made Noah's layette, right? <laughs> you know, baby clothes and flannel, but he was all into the Chinese red. Yes, so he sewed and sewed and sewed. Doug and Bob Bogdan had one raincoat that they shared between the two of them on those occasions when they had to go to Washington to uh, look into grants. Uh, so that worked pretty well, I guess, until they both had to go on the same occasion. I think it's even more involved because I don't even think the raincoat was ours. It was, it was Doug's brother-in-law's or something. I knew Bert, Bert was grooming Doug from day one. I really, I felt it, I saw it. All of what he's done makes sense in some more abstract way. The idea of being an advocate, the idea of the work serving other people rather than uh, serving your academic ego. Their ability to articulate a vision and to get others to believe in that vision and work towards it. Doug has done that throughout his career. As a person from another country, I really appreciate that he has a global vision on education. He always advocates for you know, education in the 21st century. This man has some serious insight in terms of racial inequality that exists in this system, in this educational system, right? And he got it, like he got that faculty of color can have an extra burden on their hands in terms of, of, of the amount of work that you are asked to do because of who you are. You don't feel isolated. You don't feel like, you know, you're in your office or just doing your work. And through things like the writing retreats that he sponsored for us, we really have been able to build not only collegially, but also as friends um, and to really get to know each other in more of a social way. How he and Sari have opened their home repeatedly as a, um, for, for non-tenured faculty um, as a welcoming uh, beginning of the school year. And, and that speaks to the community that you're talking about. He laughs with you, he smiles, he tells you jokes. Or, so he really humanizes that position and I think he really exemplifies a good leader. He felt that I was at a place where I should go uh, up for promotion and go up for tenure as soon as possible. It's the first time in my professional career that I've gotten some mentorship that, that talks about balance in, in those ways that um, I, think, I think really matter. I think that as the dean, uh, Doug has promoted inclusion. We have mainstreaming education, inclusive ed in this city that we take for granted that other people move to this area to get that that's all been shepherded earlier by Burton Blatt and other people before him that we still work in collaboration with the Juwonia School. I mean, look at that. The core of the idea is that people who we think can't think have something to say and you have to listen to them. It's not enough to say, well, people with disabilities are equal to anyone else or people who don't speak are wonderful writers. I mean, those, those things are important starting points, but it's to have a larger vision. And Doug has always had this larger vision that uh, a rich and inclusive society is one that uh, recognizes and celebrates the gifts and skills of all of its citizens. He diversified this faculty in a profound way, and, and now it's up to us um, to take it to the next level. And that's what, what my, hopefully my contribution to his legacy will be. I really appreciate his naming 
inclusive urban education as part of the mission for the school. He was there engaging parents. This is the Dean of the School of Education at Syracuse University. He was talking to Nottingham ninth grade parents about what we envision doing for their children um, in the future. But he really wants to be a part of the conversation and to, to push people to think about um, their work and ways to, to move it forward. He's figured out kind of how to shine the light just right on someone, how to give them support, and how to create an opportunity for them to truly shine, and I think that's one of his greatest gifts to all of us. What Doug is pretty uniquely gifted at is making everybody feel that they are capable of far more than they thought they were. I think it's sort of presumption of confidence on steroids. Well, I mean, you go into a conversation with Doug thinking, well, I don't know if we can do this, and you leave thinking, well, gosh, how did I ever think we couldn't do that? At lots of points, I would go into his office tired, exhausted, overworked, overwhelmed, and by the time I left, he would have me convinced that not only was that all okay, but that this is the best part of my life. How many layers does this guy have? <laughs> he can draw you in and make you do things you probably should say no to. Yeah. And I have learned because of Doug Bicklin, never say yes. Mm. Always say, I'm gonna think about that. <laughs> Let me get back to you. Let me get back to you. And once he said to me, listen, you can say no. Because I said, can I say no to this? Because he was asking me to do something. He goes, you can say no to as many things as you want. I'm gonna keep putting opportunities in front of you. The mentoring can happen anywhere, like on the corner while he's walking his dog, you know. His Doug embodies all of the things that we know about good leaders. And we all sort of, sort of coalesce around these greater ideals of how do we transform educational systems. I was really impressed by how quickly, you know, Doug was able to change that within, I guess, less than five years. He's kind of your academic wingman. There were a lot of needs in the School of Ed, and I think he took on a very difficult task of saying, this is a really old building, and we need to raise money to, uh, to do it. And I was lucky to collaborate with him on um, the Commons, which was his idea. And I couldn't think of a, of a sort of a building that sort of seemed more at odds with what I knew that Doug's mission was, and that was to make education um, kind of uh, be a part of everything in the community. When I got there, I was so flabbergasted at the grandeur and the light and the, the, the importance of the room to the building and how it opened everything up. I only got to know later on that Doug performed as an artist and that Doug also made films and was considered one of the more sort of radical scholars in his field. Doug really saw the power that film could have on advancing a cause or an issue. The whole struggle that he went through after introducing this into this country and then coming under attack, finally, we had this film that shattered all those questions. And that's kind of the brilliance of Doug that has kind of informed everything I've done, is that whole notion of presuming competence. It is the two most powerful words, because if you believe in that, you open up. There are classrooms full of children who you realize were losing. And that, those two words are so, are so powerful, presu presuming competence. And that's Doug. You open doors to opportunities for education that changes lives. That changes lives. I will always remember your warmth of voice, devil's chuckle, and generous smile of spirit. Both of our parents um, created an, an amazing balance. I don't know how they did it, which was made, a, made me and I assume you always feel really central to their lives. And I was aware that they were passionate, enthusiastic about their work, and more so as we got older. But, um, but I always felt that we were the most important things to them. I felt like we knew from really young age about sort of the disability work he was doing and the importance of it mm -hmm. in you know, making sure that all people were treated with dignity and had access and opportunity, um, and that, you know, it's such a formative part of growing up is thinking about those issues and talking about them with him. We were skiing and we skied one day and then the next day it was just pouring, pouring rain, not snow, just pouring rain. And I think, you know, Molly and 
I were looking outside and we were like, oh man, it's pouring. And, you know, my dad is so... I was 11 at the time. Yeah, my dad is so enthusiastic and I think very, I think that enthusiasm is very, can be very persuasive. And he was like, we are going, you know, we're, we're going to go skiing. Um, this is what we do. I think the other funny thing about that story is that, um, one, we, you know, we still tell it about his dedication to, to skiing. Um, and the way he has since told it is that he was a little bit unsure or maybe petrified about <laughs> what he was going to do with the four of us inside the house all day. So he was like, <laughs> I am going to get them on the slope regardless. I'm really proud of my dad for his work over the years and also taking a stand at unpopular positions. I mean, with so much in the early 90s around facilitated communication, he was just pilloried in the press and so many negative things were said about him. And he, you know, it got him down certainly, but he just kept on doing what he believed in and what um, was important to him and really didn't do things for, you know, political reasons or um, to get more prestige or anything like that. And that has always been a tremendous lesson for me. What a special person, what an extraordinary gem. And it's been an honor to be a partner, to get to know, to have as a friend, um, a person of that amazing strength and, and commitment. Integrity. Gentle, compassionate, visionary. Leadership. I mean, just, under, just, under, just understanding. Courageous, dignified. Visionary. Adult. Empowering. Inspiring. Genuine. Innovative, caring, no hyphen. Purple. One of a kind. He's smiling. He's committed. He's engaged. He's just good people. Timely. Depth. Generosity. Doug is a loyal friend. Compassionate. Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Loving. Doug Bicklin is the dean who wore great ties. Try it again. Doug Bicklin is the dean who hired me. <laughs> if Doug Bicklin was an animal, what would he be? <laughs> a koala. <laughs> right. It's no. the multicolored beard. Right. No, he's, yeah. No, maybe I won't say that. Yeah. <laughs> Do a different one. If Doug Bicklin were an ice cream flavor. I'd have to say Neapolitan. Why is that? Um, because, you know, there's, I don't know why. This, this seemed like a nice thing to say. I don't think this part's going well. Uh, Doug Bicklin will be remembered as the dean who... Created a million dollar walkway to Starbucks. <laughs> ah, that's it. We're done. <laughs> that's <Good>. a wrap. <laughs> that is a wrap.